but I don't have power. There you go. But it's not Ryan's fault. Tell you tell me when you when we are on. Oh, not making jokes. Well, good morning. From the lion's den to the left in there. Um, been enjoying this these lessons a lot. Uh, we had a. Um, it's sometimes. Sometimes the Sabbath school lessons become really deep and and requires requires a deeper study, which is nothing wrong with that. But these lessons bring us a lot of the promises and a lot of the things that the Lord has done for these individuals of in a very simple way of things that we can claim as a as a God's followers. And that's perhaps the thing that I have enjoyed the most is that that Bible can be very simple. And that reminds me of the text that says the only way that we can fear the future is that, and I'm paraphrasing by the way, it's not, is is the, the version according to Eduardo, but the only way that we can fear the future is if we forget what the Lord has done in the past. So let's start with a, with a word of prayer and I would like to invite anyone, anyone, maybe Lisa, would you mind? No? Anybody nearby that would like to have a word of prayer? All right, not everyone, just, just one at a time. All right, Anne. Can you, Lisa, would you mind giving the mic to Lisa? Thank you. Father God, this is the day to remember who you are, our creator, the God above all things that we can even imagine. Help us to celebrate who you are and how much you love us and how much we can be devoted to you and dedicate this day to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are, uh, through this quarter's lesson, we are uh, looking into Daniel. The life of Daniel, not just as a prophet, but just as an individual, as a professional, as a individual in in the time the time where where a lot of changes in the world so let me let me bring you to let's get a let's create a timeline a little bit so when he was a child he was in Jerusalem then the um, Babylon people invaded Jerusalem took this bunch of kids take them all the way to Babylon when they were in Babylon, they started feeding them, they started giving them a whole bunch of things, they didn't want to eat that stuff, and they decided to go on their own. They find, they find how many times wiser? Do you guys remember? 10 times wiser than the other ones. Um, he then um, became, and his friends, became one of the uh, wise people in the kingdom. And then the, the king had a dream, Nobody knew what a dream was, not even the king. And the Lord gave that to Daniel. And from that point, Daniel became the, one of the head uh, counselors of the king. Well, after many years, the king died. Then what happened? The son took over. What happened with the son? Do you guys remember the son? Nabopolaz, well, Nabopolazar. Nabonidus. What was that? Nabonidus. Nabonidus. There you go. Then it comes to a point that um, they were going to invade Babylon. A new kingdom came to invade Babylon. They had a wonderful way to invade it. Very interesting if you look into the history how they, they got invaded. Took over the kingdom. And now we have a new kingdom. The, who are the names? There are two great leaders in there, one bigger than the other one. Who are they? 
and Cyrus and Darius. Cyrus and Darius. Which one, which one was a better leader than the other one? Probably Cyrus, but he was, seemed to have been busy somewhere else, so he left Darius to take care of that particular yeah. spot. Because what they did, they divided the kingdom in 129 provinces or states. I'm very, very familiar with the word province because Costa Rica has seven provinces. Canada has provinces instead of states. They work a little bit different, than, politically a little bit different than the state. They're not as independent as, as the state might be, at least here compared to the states. But they had 129 provinces. What I find very interesting is that regardless who the king is, Daniel seems to have a prominent place in their government. See, a lot of times, and you see this, a lot of times when the new government comes in, all the counselors, all the uh, people that has the prescience of the king's ear, what happened with them? Done, they get fired. They know that. They're out. Not with Daniel. New kingdoms. They kill, the, or the king died, whatever they might be. Daniel has maintained a place of leadership in the kingdom. And This seems more remarkable in this case because the change of regime was not just a new president got elected. It was a foreign power came in and kicked out people and took over. Absolutely. So what did they want with Daniel? I don't know, but they, well, the we, Lord was in it. We, we, know, we know a few reasons why, and we will review some of those, but yeah, it, it is, it, you're absolutely right. It is more important than just today cases. The king, it was a completely, it was an invasion, takeover power. It was, it was a really hostile takeover. And the king, get rid of, in most cases, kill the closest people to the previous king, the king and the closest people and their families, because that was the way that they actually can have full control of that area. Not Daniel. So Daniel became one of the 129 governors. Daniel 6, 4 says this. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they couldn't find no charge or fault. Because he was what? Faithful. The, the second part, the last part of that verse is probably the one that is more attractive to me. He was not just faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. A lot of times we talk about the um, relationship that he might have had with God. Well, in my opinion, in that text is not talking about the relationship with God. Can we read it again? Second part. But they could, could find no charge or fault. Oh, we are all humans. Because he was faithful. It doesn't say that he was faithful to God, and it is no necessarily attachment to be faithful to God. It says he was faithful. Nor there was any error or fault found in him. So it's not that God is necessarily protecting him. We know that is a fact. But when it says that he was faithful, there's another word used for faithful, faithful that is presented in the lesson too. He was faithful trustworthy. He said they, have, they found no error or foul found in him. 
Yes, a human, I imagine, he has some errors or faults, but he was trustworthy. In addition to that, he was an individual that did his job well. It was his character. It was his character who made, made him outstand. It was his character that said, defining people, you know what, between different kings, you know what, that guy, I can trust him. I am not taking away God's blessings and God's um, um, protection and God's work in him. What I'm trying to bring this up is that he, the Daniel, as an individual, was a trustworthy individual that did a wonderful job. He was a great, he had a great character. And I believe that just with that brings us a point that we need to learn. Well, I don't want you to answer this. Are you a great character? Are you trustworthy? Between the different kings of our worlds, I'm talking about our bosses, are you be one of those that is believed to have a character as such that doesn't matter who the new boss may be, you will be chosen as one of the leaders of that group? Still, things to consider. Things to consider. Well, then he comes, here comes the other people. Remember, they were talking 129 different provinces. There's 128 additional governors and leaders. Uh, and some of them, there were people, I will say the majority of them, there were people that had followed the king since before they took over. Why? Because they were trustworthy people that the, that the king relied to, people that the king is going to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to give you this job, and I'm going to give you this area. And the, one of the biggest fears of the kings in those days, even in these days, but mostly in those days, was I cannot lose any territory. Can't lose any territory. That is, shows the weakness. If I lose a territory, somebody, some of these other 129 people will want to have some of their own territories. So he needed to put people that was close to him that he could trust. So the other 128 people start looking around, and I'm going to add, I'm going to add some to the story. To me, and this is my opinion, to me they start talking to each other and said, and what's with that guy Daniel? Wasn't he loyal to Nebuchadnezzar? Wasn't he loyal to before that? I said, isn't he a Hebrew? Let's start looking for it. I bet he's corrupt like we are. But if we protect ourselves, we protect ourselves. You get my back, I get yours. You know, we get Lisa on it, we have the 128 other. We just protect everybody around. We can get this guy. Where, where are we going to be starting? Again, remember, this is my mind playing around. I'm going to start. The best place to start when you're looking for corruption, for corruption is where? Money. Hmm. How much taxes they're bringing in? Money and power. Let's bring the first the corruption, the money. We're in the computer. See, how's the taxes? You know, who is they doing? How are they distributing the taxes? Are they, they collected this money for, to fix in the roads. Are they fixing those? They are fixing the roads. Can use that one. Maybe he's taking money. Let's go to the bank account. And they go to the Swiss bank accounts. They go to the different places over there in the computer. And they pull it out. He said, you know, this guy gets his salary. And there's nothing else. It's interesting because when this text says they found no error. And no charge or fault. Years ago, I read this article that says that in offices, there are, there are some people, when you work in the office, there are some people that believe that paper clips and staplers 
belongs to them. And when somebody moves out of the office, either to another office, or they leave, or they get terminated, one of the first things they take in their box with their personal things are the staples. <laughs> the stapler. Think about that. And clips, paper clips. Pens. I mean, there was, there was a list of about 15 different things that the employees think that those belongs to them personally, even though the company pays for it. So if you're planning to fire somebody, just remove the stapler <laughs> first. Just say, can I borrow this? Hey, by the way, I need to talk to you. All right, let's, let's keep talking. Um, they found no error, not even a stapler, a stapler or not even a, a paperclip was removed from, was faulted from him. It says zero. The jealousy continued. When are, when are we going to get him? When are we going to get him? We need to get him. And they went straight to his character. Where can we get him? Well, it's vegan. Let's avoid plant-based foods. You can only eat pork. So now that guy will live for 30 days. That's okay. We can do that. Let's remove all breads. Which is part of my passion, breads. Now that guy will do something else. And they went to the heart. The only thing that we can attack this guy on is in his personal beliefs. So they went in, went to the, to the king, and said, hey, king, hey, let's do this. Let's do this. You are greatest. And by the way, when somebody, especially people that reports to you and start giving you a whole bunch of you are the best watch out they want something you are the greatest king there is nothing better than you look what you have done look at this Babylon was huge and now you you own all these 129 different provinces and it's true it was huge we need to do something because we want to be sure that everybody understands that you are our leader. Where do you think that his head, the king's head, is start going to go? I imagine that in someone that they were talking to them. I remember that's 128 people. So talking to him how great he was. He probably started, no, no. And then a little bit later, it's like, a, well, you know, you're right. I am pretty good. You know what? Hmm. And they deceived the king in many different ways. One of the ways they deceived him is they said, we, all the 129 governors, leaders, have agreed that we should have a day, I mean, we should have a month, 30 days, where no one will worship or pray anybody else, no celestial, no divine, no human, but you. You know what? And here's part of the deceiving. Remember, one of the things that I said earlier, that says that the kings are always concerned that they are going to be, that somebody's going to take a portion of the territory. And in having the, the 129 different governors come to you and say, and we have decided that we are going to do this just to be sure that everybody understands that you are it. In that moment, I believe he thought, you know, that's a good way to show everybody, especially these 129 people, that they still depend on me. Beside the political aspect, I imagine that he felt good. See, and the deceiving is that they said that the whole 129 have agreed to this. Who was one of those 129? Who was it? Daniel. 
Did he ask about Daniel? I don't think so. Again, he was deceived. So he didn't ask about a hundred, the, the one of them. He just felt, they are right. Notice what the lesson says. So, they soon realized, talking about 128, they soon realized that the, in order to frame Daniel, they will have to produce a situation in which Daniel will be faced with a dilemma of obeying their God, the God's law, or the law of the empire. Remember, this is a Daniel that has followed the laws of whatever empire has been through his life. He has followed them. But they put him against the wall. The lesson continues saying, from that, the officers have learned about Daniel. They are absolutely convinced that under the right conditions, he will side with his God's law over the empire. Here's another lesson. Would you be recognized as an individual that would side with God's law over any other rule? Are you recognized as one of those? Remember, these lessons are meant to make us think. Are you trustworthy, regardless who your boss or who the individuals is, are? Are you trustworthy regarding who your landlord might be? If you don't own your own home? Are you trustworthy to be able to follow all the rules, regardless who the person in charge is? Are you probably, here's the most important, are you recognized as an individual that will follow God's law? Oh, well, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a kidding way, sometimes I tell people when they say, oh, yeah, that's a good point, or, or something that we have to do that is the right thing to do, I, I tell people, I am almost honest. Almost honest. No. Are you almost honest or completely honest? When you realize they give you 10 more cents, do you go back? Daniel was absolutely an individual that the only way they could get him was by touching his character with God, the relationship with God. That portion of the lesson says, what a testimony, testimony, testimony of Daniel's faithfulness. So when you are not around anymore, or when you change your work, when you close your business, when you're retired, somebody will say, there's a person that always follow God. All right, jealousy. Took them everywhere. Let's go to Daniel 6, 6 to 9 now. Daniel 6, 6 to 9. Anybody? It's a quiet bunch today. Anybody? So the administrators and the high officers went to the king and said, and, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So the administrators and the high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. Verse 7 says, we are all in agreement. We, the administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone divine or human, except to you, your majesty, 
will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue a sign, this law, so it can, cannot be changed, and officials law and the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So the Medes and Persians have this rule, I guess is the way to put it, that once the king signed whatever, it cannot be changed, cannot be reversed. It's kind of weird. Do you consider that a little bit? <laughs> Do you consider that to be concerning? See, when I was in college, I remember I used to have a teacher, I mean, in, in religion, and we studied this a little bit, and I remember asking this question. It doesn't make sense in any society. Really? I remember, I, I, I see, I remember, I can see his face. He kind of, kind of smirking and smiling. And, and, then, and then he said, here's the reason why. They have this rule to show that the king never makes a mistake. That his rule was always sure. Therefore, the king will not get back. And I was like, well, that makes sense. That does appear silly, promulgating the decree that he soon wished he could have repealed. Now, there, there's absolutely no evidence in the Bible that the king, the Darius, felt that he, that he had any divine authority. It's not like the Egyptians that, that felt that the Pharaoh was absolutely everything, was the God. No, there's nothing in the Bible that says that he was actually, you know, hey, I am God. No, the, the point in here is that he could not make a mistake. What he decided was it. So there was not something of a divine, it was something of pride. Pride. How many times have pride, was it prideness or pride or being proud? How many times being proud had got you in trouble? How many times? Let me give you a simple one. My dad taught me, using the Bible, that you never sit, sit at the head of the table unless you've been asked. So my dad said it's better for you to, to people to tell you, and I was a child, and my dad always pounded that on me. You never sit at the head of the table unless you've been asked. It's better for people to say, hey, you, you, I want you to sit at the head of the table and then move to the head of the table. Then moving the head of the table had to tell them, hey, you're not supposed to be sitting there. So, tr trust me, I have learned that, <laughs> learned that, but I have seen cases when people go in, sit at the head of the table, they believe that's the place where they should be at. And the head of the house comes in and says, I'm sorry, this is my place. Ouch. Pride. Are you a proud person? Is any, by, by, by the way, is, any, is there anything wrong to have pride, to be proud? It's a, it's a, it's a sticky question. Is there anything wrong to be proud? Got to define your terms. Well, now you make it difficult for me. It was a yes or no answer, and come on. <laughs> Better avoid it. <laughs> Is there anything wrong to be proud? Well, Lucifer went wrong. Lucifer went wrong. Shall we, prou shall, shall we be proud of our kids? Did God 
Is God proud of us when we choose him? He commends us. He takes satisfaction in us, but I don't know that it's pride. Perhaps. See, the, the, the pride that is a sin, the pride that is a sin is the one where I believe I deserve It is my place to be there. I am better than anybody else. There's a pride. Let me, let me put it this way. Your son, your daughter gets, gets an award in school for, I don't know, be the kindest student in the whole school in this school year. Just to be kind. This person is gorgeous, is, is obedient, is nice to other people. They open the door to, to, to people that work with them. They're just a kind individual. So you should not be proud of that student. Should be proud of that student. The, pri the pride that got Satan in trouble is when he starts saying, this is my position. I am equal to God. I deserve that. It's for me to be there, not for you to tell me whether I should be or not. That's a type of pride that becomes a problem. I deserve that. I own this. I am entitled, and that's a problem, personal problem I have with today's society. Everybody's entitled of everything. You park in the parking lot, I am entitled to your parking spot. I'm entitled for you not to be in front of me. I'm entitled to honk my horn when I am, because I'm going 10 miles and faster than you do. I'm entitled to your money, because I don't have any. That's the type of pride that is a problem. If you, if you see Satan, Satan, what was Satan's problem? What kind of pride? He said... I should be there with God. I am one of them. <laughs> Good point. I want to be, no, no, I, I don't want to be. I am above them. That's the pride that becomes a problem. I also, you know, joking around, I tell people sometimes, I am so proud to be humble. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way, right? I am so proud to be humble. That's the problem, that's the kind of proudness that is a problem. And, and, and then that issue, that, that pride becomes in many different ways. When somebody starts telling you, and giving you flowers and saying that you are so good. And you say, and then that doesn't necessarily mean it. Or perhaps you are. You are so good. You should do this. You should do that. And then your head is start ballooning. Watch out for that pride. I am concerned, and that, that happened, unfortunately, recently. I, I, well, recently, within a few years. I, I told somebody, you know, I hope that the Lord guide you as you preach today. That individual looked in my eyes and said, oh, he will. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I guess you deserve that. And Darius went in and signed that. Law, that into law for the next 30 years. <laughs> because I'm so good. My, my humble and pride became an issue now. You know what? You're right. I am that good. And <laughs> don't say anymore. Yeah, got it. <laughs> I am that good. You know what? I deserve to be, to be worshipped. That was another problem with Satan. I deserve to be worshipped. I deserve for the people to understand that I am the king. I deserve for the people to understand that I am the boss. I deserve for the people to understand that, oh, I am, oh, I am a church leader. I deserve it. 
And Darius got into that issue. They got into that issue that he was, actually he was not, he got in trouble. Trouble on his own. Signed the letter. Signed the, the, that into law. And guess what happened? The law had punishment. As most laws has a punishment. Hey, this is the law. If you don't do it, this is what's going to happen to you. If you don't say what is going to be happening to you, well, it's not a law. And, and well, it was one of the things that I personally, this is my personal opinion, I do not, I do not appreciate for some type of disciplinary that the parents use is sometimes with a one, two, one, two. One of our nephews, actually two of our nephews, the parents use that type of discipline. And one day, we were in Christmas, and they were counting one, two, since seven in the morning. And this is like nine, and the kids were not going to bed. You're not going to bed. One, two, and one, two. And I was like, a three, pick up the kid, put him in bed. You stay there. And the kids stayed there. Anyways, got in trouble with the parents, but oh well. We got into the point that we need to do what the law says. And the law said that we're going to send whoever fails into worship only the king for the next 30 days. We put him in the lion's den. It's interesting, I didn't know this. The penalty for transgression is to, is to be cast into the lion's den. Since the kind of punishment that is, that is not a test elsewhere, it may have been an ad hoc suggestion of Daniel's enemies. Ancient Near Eastern monarchies placed lions in cages in order to release them on certain occasions for hunting. So there was no shortage of lions to maul whoever dared to violate the king's decree. Because that was one of the questions that sometimes we have. Is that, well, why would they have a lion's den? I mean, how many people needed to be killed in the lion's den? It continues saying, um, so there was no shortage of lions to maul whoever there to violate the king's decree. Second, the decree cannot be changed. The unchangeable nature of the law of the Persians and Medes, also mentioned in Esther 119, Darius Siculus, the ancient Greek historian, mentioned that in occasions when Darius III, not confused with Darius mentioned in Daniel, changed his mind but could not longer repeal the death a sentence he had passed on an innocent man. So apparently this Darius the third um, they give the sentence to to somebody, a death sentence to somebody, and then they figure out that the, the individual was innocent and they could not change it. They had to kill the innocent man. So why did Daniel now turn around? And now he's aware now of the law. He's one of the governors. He knows about the law. What did he do now? What is his next step? I know we know the story. It's just a quiet bunch of people this morning. This when? Why? He went to the window and prayed. And Becky, you said it right on. Why? Because he, well, that's what he was accustomed to do. And he didn't pull the curtains. No. He didn't pull the curtains. Do you think that that doesn't make any sense? Think that that make, makes any sense? Especially in these days that you don't want to offend anybody. Seriously, you tell somebody, hey, nice jacket. <gasps> He's harassing me. You don't want to offend anybody these days. Does that make any sense? Would have made any difference. And, 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 and bear here with me for a second would have made any difference in, in his relationship with God that he would have done exactly the same thing 
with the windows closed would have made any difference in their relationship with God. So why didn't he? Anna. There's a saying don't, uh, to avoid even the appearance of evil. If he had hid his prayers, God could have heard him anywhere. But the things that would look like and witness to the other people as though he were giving in and he did, was not valuing his God as highly as he did. Well, but Becky said something else though. Becky said that that was his custom. So I don't think, personally, I don't think that he was opening the windows to, to, to share his message with other people. I, I don't think that it was not a witness's statement. It, it would be a, a witness to them if he quit doing it, though. If he didn't have that habit, he could have prayed anywhere in any way he wanted to. But he, he would have been giving in to them and showing that he was backing down before their power and he wasn't valuing God as much as before if he changed what he was doing. Okay. And he didn't. It just doesn't make sense to humans. Have you, have you ever gone to eat to a restaurant with people that don't believe the same way that you do? No, actually, you should start that question before. Do you pray for your meals? Do you have gone to a restaurant, to a place, with people that they don't share the same beliefs as you do? Amen. So now a lesson. There's a text in the Bible that says we should never be ashamed of the gospel. And not, and not for witnessing. I, 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 I see what Anne is saying, but people, we don't do things because we necessarily witness every single time, every single moment of our lives. We should not ask people to, you, know, you want to pray with me? Come on, everyone. nobody eats until you pray with me. But it's okay to say, just give me a second. Bow and pray. People will attack you for that. Some people will. My wife and I, it was quite a few years ago, we went to Natural Cafe in Thousand Oaks. I mean, in, in Oxnard. No. Nope. Moore Park. They're going the whole county now, you know. In Moore Park. When we're getting our food, um, there was these young kids. I will say there were like five of them, 14, 15 years old. And when we were waiting for a meal, this kid received their meal, and they hold hands and prayed together for their meal. 14, 15 years old. I was like, a, whoa. It became a testimony, obviously. It became a testimony. I don't believe these kids intended to do this as a testimony. I don't believe these kids intended to do this as a testimony. These kids did this because that is their custom. Daniel did not close the windows because he was going to be saved. He didn't close, he didn't, actually he could have... <laughs> He could have prayed without being in the window. Actually, he could have been away from the window and nobody see him. No, he did it because that is his custom. Is his in the DNA? It was something that not, it, nothing is going to make for that to change. Nothing is going to make to change that. Yes. Let me give you a mic. Well, let's see. There should be another one back over here. There it is. Because I have a big sign over there that says, don't let anybody talk without a mic. And I let Becky. <laughs> I was trying to find where I read it because I just read it this week. But one of the reasons why Daniel prayed 
at that window because that window was facing Jerusalem and it was one of their customs when they kneel down to pray to try to face Jerusalem. Exactly, yeah, that was a custom. Nothing, remember, remember when we talked earlier is that they, they tried to attack his character. It was already in, embedded in his character these three times a day to pray. He was not praying just for the people. He also was praying to be faithful and to be honest and to be a representative of God and have wisdom to deal with the problems that we have. Here's another lesson. How many times do you close the, the, your office in these days and cubicles or you just go to the corner and you pray that the Lord can give you wisdom to deal with the issue that you're working on how many times do you do that three times a day it was embedded and they knew that the enemies knew that they knew that. They knew that he was not stopped doing it. In spite of the prohibition to make petition to any man or God but the king, Daniel ta takes no precaution to hide or to disguise his prayer's life during those critical 30 days. No provision. No plans. Let me give you this. This is another lesson. Do you trust God? Some do. Some don't. The lesson is this. He was not afraid of any consequences. It was not that God was going to save his life. It was not that God was going to make a miracle. It was not that. He didn't know that. What he knew and what he counted on it is that his relationship with God was such that whatever happened, he was going to be faithful to God. And that, my friends, is trust. That he had a, a sureness that he was not going to be killed by the lions? No. Now, let's go now to the other side. Let's go now to the other side because there is something very interesting. Then the king comes in, goes to work in the morning, and they said, there's 128 governors in there. They, just, they were just there the next morning and, and saying, hey, you wonderful king. Hey, you know, hey, woo, the best. And he's like, oh, I wonder what great ideas they have today. Hey, buddies, and everybody, hey, we king, hey. We have bad news for you, sir. One of us, one of our team, is not obeying the law you signed in yesterday. Who? Daniel. I believe in that moment, boom, it hits him. Actually, more than boom, it's like a boom. It hit him what actually had in that moment, the king said, I know, in his mind, I know Daniel prays three times a day. I know he does that. This was a frame. And through the entire day, he just went in and he tried to figure it out. How can he stop that decree? And he can't. Finally, those wonderful friends comes in and they said, 
Sir, we have 128 witnesses of this. You cannot stop it. You need to bring Daniel, throw him in the den. He said, okay, notice what it says. It says, um, the lesson says, the pit Daniel, Daniel against the king, they pit, I'm sorry, they pit Daniel against the king by saying to Daniel, does not show due regard of you. Look what they're saying to the king. Daniel does not really care about you. O king, or for the decree that you have signed. Completely disrespected. You know what? He's, he's a Hebrew. He's in one of, that's what they said. He's in one of those, those slaves that came like, a, I don't know how many years ago. He doesn't respect. He's trying to do something against you. He has no regard for you. You must give him punishment. Again, his own will. They allowed, they put Daniel into the, um, into the uh, den. Which is not what is the important thing. It says that Daniel went in. I imagine, and this is my, again, my own imagination, I, I believe that Daniel didn't fight. It was not like, hey, leave me alone now. And I'm trying to fight. He said, like, okay, well, it is what it is. They opened what they call the mouth of the den. And he walked in. Question for you. Did at that point, Daniel knew he was going to be saved? Ms. Geraldine, what do you think? You don't think so? He didn't know. He didn't know. He went in trusting God's will. You see the difference? Trusting God's will doesn't mean that I am always going to be safe. Trusting God's will doesn't mean that I will never get sick. Trusting God's will doesn't mean that he will always save me from the accident. Trusting God's will is Trusting God that whatever will happen from this point on is the best for me. No, hang on a second. We're getting there. We're getting there. No, no, let's not jump ahead because I think that is critical for the lessons that we need to learn. God did not prevent it, Daniel enemies from casting him into the lion's den. Did not prevent it. Could God have prevented it? Man, a little earthquake that breaks the den and all the lions go out. There you go. He permitted evil angels and wicked men thus far to accomplish their purpose. He, let me, read, let me read this. He permitted evil angels and wicked men thus far to accomplish their purpose. But it was that he might make the deliverance of his servant more marked. Two important words, thus far. They wanted him dead. They're correct. To prevent more uh, the mark. It, and the defeat of the enemies of truth and righteousness more complete. 
I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what issues you're going through. I may know some. I don't really don't know what you're going through. What I can tell you is, if you trust God, He will do the best that is for you. Even if at times the best is not what we want. Remember I asked you earlier, do you trust God? Everybody's like, yeah, we trust God. Do you trust God to this point? See, that's just an important lesson. This, that's part of the things that the, 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 the lesson is bringing up to us. It's not just an historic event, history, a book with nice things about God's protection. When Daniel walked into that den, when he was thrown into the den, he did not know that God was going to save him. He trusted God regardless of the end. Are you there? No. Are you walking to be there? Do you trust him in the minimal things, the minor, minor things? Do you trust God in the minor, minor things? Do you pray God more than three times a day for the meals? Do we normally repeat the same thing? Thank you for the food. Amen. Are you afraid of the consequences of what the world is trying to do to us in spite of our relationship with God? Do you really trust Him? So let's go now to Daniel 6.16. Daniel 6.16. So the king went in and he could not sleep. He was all night long waiting for that sign. I don't know how the night was. I believe that he was paying attention to seek and hear somebody talking into the den. I, I, I like to believe that he was laying down in bed and he is listening to the lions, calling his assistant and said, have you heard anything? All right, verse 16 says this. Uh, again, I'm reading, uh, reading from the New Living Translation. It says this. So at that last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. Oh. Now, who's a faithful? Who's a faithful? The king. The king is so faithful now. May your God, who you have served so faithful, may rescue. So Daniel, Daniel had not had a relationship with the king alone. I mean, with God alone. He had a relationship with the king. And he, the king, he was so affected by the king. Sorry, let me rephrase that. He was, the king was so affected by Daniel that he knew he had a friend of him. He had learned about Daniel. He had learned what he uh, what the Lord has done for him. He has learned about God through Daniel. He was his friend. And he had learned that if you are faithful to the size of the master's seed, the Lord will respond. Daniel had a whole tree of faith. Master tree of faith. A bush. The king just got planted his. He just had planted his tree. 
and he hoped. So we go now to verses 28-24. Let's go, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Daniel 6, 24-28. Then the king gave orders. We read that. He had thrown into... Then the king... Oh, hang on a second. Verse 23. Actually, before that. Let's go to verse 20. He got... The king got up early in the morning. I imagine as soon as there was a little bit light, he got over there. Verse 19 says, very early in the morning, the king got up and, and hurried out to the lion's den. Very early in the morning. More than the usual. He got a whole bunch of people with him. Then he got there. He called out. Imagine, he got there and called out. And imagine the faith of this king. It says, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Now, here's the other lesson. Has your boss, the people that you work for, has so much faith in the God that you serve? Have you been able to represent that to God? Have you been able to represent God to your bosses? If you get thrown by the king to the lion's den, if people are complaining about you unfairly, if people are not doing what they're supposed to do, if people, if people are just jealous about your work, does your boss know that you're faithful to God? He ran. He went over there next morning. And he asked the wonderful question, Daniel, Servant of the living God. Notice that he didn't say servant of your living God. It's not your faith. He now recognized God as the living God. And he says, was your God who you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? And that was silence. Long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. Now let me ask a question. Was the king expecting that answer? Yes. Otherwise, he will have never run to the lion's den. He expected that answer. Look at what verse 23 says. The king was overjoyed. Overjoyed. And ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. It says, Not a scratch was found in him, for he had trusted his God. Not a scratch. That's why I believe that he was not thrown in there. He just walked in, Bolter walked in there. Not a scratch. So where's your faith? Where's your relationship with God? Do you hide when it's time to give God the blessings? You can see that our relationship with God, if it's the truth one, is automatically shared without even thinking about it. We'll share with the people that don't believe them, believe in Him. Are you there? So many people say, well, I'm going to be there when I get to heaven. Daniel made it here without getting to heaven because he had a prayer life, he had a relationship with God. These lessons are, are such small lessons that we used to, we know these lessons from the Sabbath school. We, we, 
I grew up with, I can see that there used to be these pictures like this, they hang in there, and then every week they put them around. <laughs> I can see that picture, but Daniel like this, and the light is around. We know these stories for years, but the lessons for us today as an adult are very different. Are you loving God? Are you not hiding from Him? Are you aware to, the, to, do the, do, to do the right thing regardless of the circumstances? Follow him? Are you sharing that with others? Do you trust God in spite of the consequences? Not everybody is going to be safe on the lion den. But if we trust God, it will be the best thing that ever happened. To us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Father, these this stories that we have read in the Bible hundreds of times, that we've been told since we were, we were children, how you protected Daniel, has a huge meaning for us today as an adult. If we do our work the best that we can. If we trusted you, if we have a relationship with you to the point that we cannot not pray according to our routines, according to what we have custom to do, if we continue having um, a relationship with you in spite of what some other people wants to destroy us, if we continue with you, you will always do the best for us. And that's the trust, Lord, that we ask you to give us. We are not looking to the consequences. We are not just looking to the salvation or be faithful. Um, We're not looking to be saved by the lions or not have illness or being protected in the car accident. We're not just looking for that. We want to have a relationship with you that will be such that in spite of the end result, we still love you and looking and accept where your will is. Father, thank you that we can revisit these stories. Thank you that we can learn so much. And Father, one more thing that we would like to ask is that our relationship with you be such that can be reflected to the people that do not trust you as Daniel did it with the king. Thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath and this church and these lessons. And we ask you that we can continue learning more about you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. We have, um, it's good to see you all. Good to see you all to be here at church. Um, we we have, have a wonderful service and one of the things that, that we want to share with you is, in case you haven't noticed, every Sabbath we have people that we haven't seen in a while, or people that have chosen our church to join us. Um, we have um, different, different ministries working all together, and we have a lot of announcements today regarding the different ministries. But before that, you know, um, how many of you know about Linda Vista Adventist Elementary School? How many of you know about, have you heard about that school? It's a wonderful school. Like any place in the world, we deal with issues, and we're working on it. But they're, they're having a wonderful um, fundraising. And inside your bulletin is, is the information about this. But we, they have a wonderful, or we have actually a wonderful fundraising, which is going to be this Thursday, February 20th. By the way, can you believe that February is almost gone? February 20th is Thursday. Uh, between what hours? But anyways... It doesn't say what hours. Uh, so keep um, half twenty dollars off of catering for over six hundred um, to twenty dollars. But then, if you have a complete meal, you get a discount, and the Linda Vista will get some of the funds for them, but twenty percent. So we would like to encourage you: be hungry and be sure that you can contribute to this. And at the same time, you can have a great meal and help Linda Vista. We have a lot of ministries, and one of those also ministries that we have is actually related to Newberry Park Adventist Academy. Have you guys heard about that wonderful school? My two kids were graduated from there. Wonderful school. And Caitlin has an announcement regarding a program that I know they started this year, but they are rolling with that. Good morning. Uh, yes, so Newbury Park Adventist Academy has their first robotics uh, team this year. And we've made a lot of progress on the robot and have been approved to go to Florida for the uh, competition. <laughs> um, so we're doing some run fundraising. And one of our fundraisers is we're going to be collecting recycling. So if you guys can just bring any recycling you have and leave it in the lobby, we'll pick it up every week. Yes. So it seems like it's one of those Sabbaths about fundraisers. I didn't know they were going to announce it, so sorry. But yes, Pathfinders are also fundraising. <laughs> After the service, you are going to see Pathfinders at both the entrances, and they have a special gift for you. So maybe it's not quite a fundraiser. Maybe it's just a present for you. You will get one of these little containers, or you can choose two or three or five or ten, as many as you like, off the tables. On the bottom of each of these, you will see a number. You will write your name on a paper that corresponds to this number, and then you will take it home and you will eat the lovely candies inside and then all you need to do with this free gift is you need to bring it back filled with quarters so it holds about fourteen dollars in quarters and we will also accept bills or checks in the container we are not picky not a problem so after church today make sure you stop by one of the entrances either on this end or this end and you will see some happy pathfinders there ready to help you answer any questions and things like that now um, the only thing I want you to know is that if you have small children um, if you can make sure that you as a parent go with them because sometimes the kids go and they see the candy and they love it and they grab it and then the parents like what <laughs> I have to bring it back now full so just wanted to let you know that, and thank you so much for your support of Pathfinders and all our other ministries. And then a second announcement, we're always looking for people to do children's stories. So if that's something that you would like to do on one of the Sabbaths, that would be wonderful. So please see me if you're willing to do children's story on any of the Sabbaths. I know a lot of you have talents and are able to do that. So thank you for that as well. By the way, happy Valentine's to everybody. A little bit late, but I remember when I saw my wife over there, I was like, oops. All right, so we have several announcements for different ministries. Um, one, we're going to leave it for, for one of the last ones, um, but we have Dr. We Wes Youngbird. 
Dr. Yamber tried to come over here every year. Actually, we invited him to come almost every year. Dr. Yamber is um, the author of um, Bye Bye Diabetes program, which is a fantastic. Many of us that have diabetes have been blessed with that program. He will be here next Sabbath. He will be here next Sabbath, and he will be here Friday night. He will be here Saturday morning and at 2 p.m., a program at 2 p.m. So this is, again, we, we should always invite people to come to a church, but this is also something very important that we can um, invite people. You know, diabetes, and Dr. Jeff is over here, so I don't want to give the wrong statistics, but that diabetes is one of the biggest problems the United States have. Am I correct? You say no, you're in trouble. So Dr. Dr. Yomber is going to be here next Sabbath. He's going, to, he's going to be presenting Friday night. And please look at your bulletin. But he's going to be presenting Friday night and then Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon. Great program. I invite everybody to come in. He's bringing with a new, um, a new program called Optimizing Your Health. Optimizing Your Health. So it's not just about diabetes. It's to be able to optimize your health. Also... Um, we want to invite, well, we have a couple of news about, at least one news, huge news about the whole conference. Does anybody know where the whole conference is? When? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. I think the number that we got, about 600 tickets sold. The biggest that we have had ever. 600 tickets sold. They sold out at the beginning of this week, the tickets. So... We are not going to be selling tickets as we normally do over there. We're not going to be selling tickets. It's going to be a full house because the capacity, I think the capacity is about 600 people. So it's going to be a full house, and it's going to be a great program. If you're a volunteer, uh, if you receive your letter, please be sure that you, you, you follow that rules. I mean, there's a meeting tonight. There's a meeting tomorrow at 6 in the morning or 5.30. I don't remember what time it is. Um, uh, so let's be sure that you join us for that. Now, let me, let me get, give a little bigger plug about the, co uh, the, um, the whole conference. Beside of the um, evangelistic meetings that we had last year, the whole conference is the biggest outreach that the Camarillo Seventh-day Adventist Church has. From those 600 people that are coming tomorrow, most are non-SDAs. Most. Very limited the number, even church members from us, very limited the people that attend. Most are non SDAs. So this is a very important as an outreach and it's very important. I met the other day with the, um, the um, and he's going to be in the whole conference, he said, with the um, uh, city of Camarillo um, mayor of the city of Camarillo. And he's like, it's amazing what your church is doing for the people in Camarillo and regarding to health. So this is the biggest outreach. And one day, the biggest outreach that our church has pretty much the entire year. So I invite you to continue praying for this program. It's a wonderful program. Continue praying that everything goes well and that the Lord can be a blessing for everybody attending as well, not just in the health-wise and recognizing the Lord as, as their Savior. We want to have the first reading of people that wants to move to our church. See, people who wants to move to our church. Amen, that's right. Stoberts, Tim, Kim, Kaylin, and Rachel. I know Kaylin's. Are they, Rachel, can you stand up so we know who you are? Both of you? Okay, where are your parents? Aha! Uh -huh. So they're, they are, you can sit down. They, they are requesting to move into our church. And uh, next week we have a vote to make a decision. But I want, we want to be sure that we introduce them to them. Um, we have somebody that requested almost, I don't know, six, seven months ago, and finally it's coming through, Diego and Erin um, Magaña, right there. We know, can you stand up for a second, because we only care about the kid, but you know, we also love the parents. <laughs> so they're finally moving the, the thank you, they finally we, we, were able to go through the process of, of, 
of all the paperwork that needed to be done, they finally got it back. The church board um, approved it, and now we're presenting the first reading to the church. And now next week we have a vote and decision on that. And also, um, also brand new, they came out, I don't know when, three months ago. So Ruben and Caroline, Carolina um, Perez, right there, Ruben and Carolina, please can stand, stand up too. So they... And we have so many others in the pipeline to become members of this church. So we're very excited that church continues growing. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And let's start with, we'll continue with some, some service. Morning. Morning. Now, I was just talking to Colleen over in the choir room, and she told me, Jason, it's Valentine's Day. You need some love songs. <laughs> and I told her, what are you talking about? I have decided to follow Jesus is our decoration of love. <laughs> so it may not look like love songs today, but I promise you, I thought that they were. <laughs> so... Let's sing our first song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. song is what a friend we have in Jesus. So let's sing it out because he truly is our best friend.
And our third song is Above All, which is truly God's message of love to us through the love and sacrifice of His Son. Let's sing it out, Above All. worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He, he is our God, God and, and we are the people of His pasture and, and the, the sheep, sheep of His hands. Let's remain standing and sing God's 
uh, the hymn, Give Me the Bible. Hymn number 272. for the sacrifice that you gave and that we can see every single day when we read the Bible. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your guidance. And be with us today as we worship you. And may we be ever closer drawn to you today and evermore. And we can't wait to see you soon. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Um, happy Sabbath. Today's offering goes towards the church budget. The um, church budget helps all the church ministries in the church. Um, may I ask that the deacons please stand? Um.
everybody please stand. you um, for these offerings and for allowing this church to be where it is today and for all these people here that come to worship you. I pray that these offerings can help to benefit the church and help it to continue to grow and develop so um, become even more so that we may all worship you. In Jesus name I pray, amen. All right, it's time for the children's story. So if all the children want to come up, even big kids can come up if they want this time. We'll give them a free pass. So come on up. That means adults if you want. Hey, we got one. We got a brave guy. Excellent. With boots. Do we have two? Yep, I see him coming. Those high school kids think they're too cool, right? I'm just making sure. You guys don't want to come up? Anyone else? Children's story? It's going to be a focused crowd. There we go. we got a sprinter. I like this guy. And another guy. Excellent. Any more? Big kids, little kids, adult kids want to come up? All right. I like this courage. There you go. Excellent. Thank you, Pastor, for leading. We appreciate it. we got a couple more coming in the side. A couple more. Thank you. All right. Excellent. See, they're smart. They know those that don't come up are the ones that get the questions in front of the class. All right. Just kidding. I'll ask you guys, too. Don't worry. Okay, so you guys probably all expected I was going to talk about something medical, being an emergency doctor, right? Right. And you're right. I am. How could I not? It's Valentine's Day. I got to wear red. How can we not talk about the heart? Now, I'm going to surprise you one time and pull out basketball or baseball or something, but not today. So, how, first of all, where is your heart located? Kind of in this region, right? Where? We got a couple in the middle, up here, We're kind of over here, very vague. This guy's a lawyer's kid, I can tell. Um, and, uh, okay, so the heart is a little bit off center. Now, hold up a fist. What is that? Is... Right, how about you guys? Is this size of your heart? No. <laughs> it's the size of two fists for an adult. Okay, a little bit bigger, okay, so too big. So we gotta make sure you're paying attention. Okay, so normal human heart, we're not going to go over, you're going to get an anatomy lesson here, a language lesson, maybe even a history lesson here. So if you turn around or look up there, you can see the heart. And how many chambers in the heart? Uh, four. Five? Four. Four? That's right, four. This guy's good. You got two on the top and two on the bottom. What I really want you to focus on, because I don't have a laser pointer I just learned this morning, is the bottom right chamber on there, but it's actually left on your body. And what's that called? Can everyone see? Left ventricle, right, exactly left, right there. Left ventricle. Why is the left ventricle important? Anyone? Throw one out there. We got some high school students. Any idea? Remember? What does that do? It squeezes the blood out to your body, right? So that's like the workhorse. That's what, like, gives you circulation. That's the big, important ventricle, the left ventricle. See that on the bottom right side of the screen? Pretend like you're looking at a heart. Okay, now this is where I need your help. What does it mean to have a broken heart? I need a brave volunteer. What does it mean? What is a broken heart? Have you heard someone say, oh, I've got a broken heart. Don't break my heart. Don't go breaking my heart. (laughs) Right? Okay, wait. We got someone talking. What does it mean to have a broken heart when somebody says that? It's not literal. Oh, not literal. Figurative. Boy, this guy's deep. This guy's pretty deep. I like that. Okay, anyone else? Broken heart. Have you heard? Has anyone here had a broken heart? You guys have never had a bro- you've had a broken heart? No? Has anyone lost a pet? Yes. Was that like, eh, Fluffy's gone, too bad for Fluffy. Was it sad? Okay, how did that make you feel? I was sad. Like, a little sad? Lots sad? 
a good amount. Okay. Did anyone cry? I cry. I cry when my pets die. That's pretty sad. You. you yeah, I cried. You cried like yep. how intense? Like, like, like upset for like a minute or? Um, like a few. Hours. Days. Like a day, probably. Days. Before. Days. Okay. Well, there is a medical term actually for a broken heart. Did you know that? And some of the doctors in the audience may not even know. Some of the physicians. So here's your language lesson. I want everyone to say in the, the kids first. Taka subo. Taka three times. Taka subo. Taka subo. Taka subo. Now the audience, you say that. Taka subo. Taka subo. Taka subo. What does that mean? I have no idea. I just threw that up there. No, I'm just kidding. It's a Japanese term. So you got Japanese. So what does takasubo even have to do with what we're talking about? This guy's sharp. <laughs> broken heart. So broken heart syndrome is a real medical condition. And ironically, I was thinking what I was going to talk about for children's story, and I had a case of takasubo two days ago. And what causes takasubo? Well, something very emotionally stressful. Death in the family, loss of a job, someone emotionally breaking your heart. So what happens in takasubo, and it's a Japanese term, and if you look on the bottom right, do you see that little pot on the screen? Takasubo means octopus trap in Japanese. Now this is something we didn't even know about in medicine before. We used to think how people would faint at funerals and be like, oh, they're just being emotional, they're okay. But now we know this can be real and this could actually kill people. It's a big deal. Now for kids, fortunately when your pet dies, this doesn't happen. But it can happen when you're a little bit older, like, you know, 50s, 60s, or 40s, or even 30s. But it means Japanese uh, octopus trap, Octop octopus pot trap, I think is what I mean. So the little octopus will flow in there, and it looks like that. So this is a diagram of your heart, briefly. And what was the ventricle that was important on that, on that uh, anatomy picture I wanted you to pay attention to? The left ventricle, right. So that's a normal left ventricle. But if you look to the second picture on the bottom right, it looks different, the, it, looks, yeah, it looks bigger, and it looks like that octopus trap there, that pot trap coming out. So what happens in this condition, and this will all tie together, don't worry, I promise, <laughs> uh, is your heart is stressed, and it dilates, and it spasms that ventricle, and it freezes, essentially, and it doesn't work qu quite well. So normally it should look like the one on the, the third picture on the bottom, but it looks like that second. And so you actually mimic a real heart attack. And it looks like a real heart attack. And it can actually cause real things, kind of like a heart attack. So what's interesting about this is there's some theories out that Jesus may have died of Takasubo syndrome. So what happened to Jesus on the cross? A Roman soldier took a spear and stuck it in his chest. And what came out? Does anyone remember? Water. How can water, like, it sounds funny, right? Water, we have blood in our body. Um, that is only possible if the human heart bursts. Well, when your heart is so irritated and it's so uh, inflamed, or if you have something like Takasubo syndrome, you can get something called a pericardial effusion, which is fluid in the heart, and that's clear fluid. And so it usually only happens under severe emotional duress. Now, Jesus was on the cross. He was weighing the world literally on his heart. And he was obviously emotionally stressed. So the question is, did Jesus possibly die of Takasubo syndrome as well as everything else? So that is possible from a physiological standpoint, historical standpoint, that Jesus may have died from this condition from so much stress. So your heart weighs less than a pound. It beats over 100,000 times a day, 2.5 billion times in a lifetime. Blood vessels enough to go twice around the world. And without your heart, it ceases to work. So what does the Bible say about our heart? Well, how many times is, the heart, is, the Bible mentioned, is your heart mentioned in the Bible? Five times? Ten times? Any ideas? How about a guess? How many times is heart mentioned? We, we got some deserters. What do you think? How many times is heart mentioned? Any ideas? Take a guess. Fifty? Fifty, good guess. A lot. A lot. The best answer. Again, probably another lawyer's daughter. Um, so it's mentioned 826 uh, 26 times, I believe, is the... Oh, sorry, guys. 826 times. How many times is your brain mentioned in the Bible? Zero. That's right, zero. So the heart is symbolically very important. Yes, you, we want to say one more thing. Because in the Bible, your heart and your brain are the same thing, pretty much. 
That's right, they should be tied. So when, Jesus, when, the, word, when the Bible uses the word heart, it's, ref, it's referring to the ruling center of the whole person. So your desires, your spiritual activity, the operations of human life. So what you put in your heart is a symbol, meaning if you're into your iPhone or your Samsung or clothes or money or your jobs, if those things are in the center of your heart, that's probably not the best. You need Jesus in your heart, right? And you need him to be the center of your heart, not just physically, spiritually, but mentally as well. So let's finish with the Bible verse, Proverbs 4, 23 through 27. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free, free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. So let's say a prayer, guys. If you guys want to bow your heads, we'll say a prayer. Dear Jesus, we ask that you bless these children up here today. Most importantly, we ask that you guard their hearts and let them open their hearts to you first, Lord, and be protective of what they allow to come in their hearts and let them be a living example of the sacrifices you made for us and live the life that you want them to live. In your name, amen. All right, if you guys want to grab the lamb's offering, we'll let other people give from their heart. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they, had, they should bring be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before ne Nebuchadnezzar. Sorry. <laughs> then the king in inter interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding, but which the king ex examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astro astrologers 
who were all in his, re in his realm. Amen. I'd like to invite all who are able to kneel. Father in heaven, Lord, we just come before you to praise you, Lord, and thank you so much for all your blessings, for your love, for your grace, and most of all, for your son, Jesus, Lord. This morning, we'd like to invite your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be present and to prepare the way to open our hearts and our minds to receive the message you would have us to, Lord. I want to lift up Pastor Jason. I pray that you will give him your words and your wisdom, Lord. And Father, I also want to lift up all the uh, people in the bulletin who are uh, going through serious illnesses right now. Lord, you know who they are. There's so many, and I just pray that you will comfort them, and if it's in your plan, that you will heal them, Lord. And Father, I also pray for the congregation, and those especially who are maybe going through this, difficult times, carrying heavier burdens than others, Lord. I pray that you will just comfort them and give them your peace and help them to know that it's going to be okay, Lord, because you are sovereign. You are our God, and you are in control, Lord. And most of all, you love us, Lord. You've given all of heaven for us and your son. And I just pray that everything we do, everything we say, Lord, may it glorify you may it lift you up and we long to see you we long to be with you and we thank you for hearing our prayer and we ask all these things in jesus name amen So I'm sure today that many of you came to church expecting a sermon on Valentine's Day and uh, maybe some of you were even hoping that I'd tell you a ridiculous story of one of my rejections, but that's not happening today. Today, I believe that one of the greatest messages that has been given to us in the Bible is the message of health. Health is huge. In fact, it makes sense to have a topic of health and the a way that God has tried to preserve our lives, especially since God is the creator and sustainer of life. So if there's someone who's going to understand it best, I believe that it's going to be God. Now, I want to give two really quick disclaimers. Number one, I am not a doctor, and I am not a psychiatrist, but that does not mean that I cannot understand what the Word of God says and what, the, uh, what God has left behind for us in scriptures and for what he can teach us there. So I'm not going to be like Jeff Davies and come up here and give you diagrams of your heart and of your brain and of your arteries and tell you about how you're clogging them with cheese or anything like that. That's not my role. My role here is to show you what the Bible says about the topic of health and what it means in the context of history, in the context of today, and how to apply it. And I also want to show you today the danger of what happens when we just take the Bible at surface value. I'm going to show you text where the Bible has been used incorrectly, especially in the topic of health. How we argue this, how we debate it amongst people, and how we come to the conclusion of this topic of health. As I also want to remind you that we, as an Adventist church, do have a doctrine on 
not only Christian behavior, but on temperance and healthy living habits. So, in no way, shape, or form today am I going to try to tell you to not be healthy. Please understand that. That in no way today are any of these verses, especially when they are brought out of context, am I trying to say, hey, guess what? You can do these things now. By no means. That is not what I'm saying. Also, some of you are aware that I am not vegan yet. Yet. I never thought that I would even consider the thought of being vegan until I came here. And I will admit that those of you who are and who remind me, please continue to do so. I am working on it. Um, but all of us are on a journey, and all of us are working towards getting to a better place. Today, I want to promote health. I want to promote a plant-based diet, and I want to show how it is exemplified in the Bible. But please do not say, well, I'm going to ignore Pastor Jason just because he is not vegan. Okay, please don't do that. Understand that this is a, a biblical principle that is established within the Bible, and we are going to discuss that today. So, without further ado, let's pray, and then let's start getting into God's Word. Father God, I'm so thankful for this day. I'm thankful for the message that you have left behind of health. And I pray, Lord, that you be with us, that you be with our hearts and our minds. May we be willing to accept this message, and may we honestly be willing to take a piece of it and see if it's worthy to bring into our hearts. May it challenge us, may it move us, may it change us, and may it be used in a way to draw ourselves and others closer to you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So we can't start about, we can't start the topic of health without talking about the original plan of creation. So we have to start in Genesis. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Some people, uh, whether they are uh, pastors, whether they are researchers, different people, when it comes into the field of religion, they struggle over the context of the biblical passages of, chapters gen of Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Some people try to argue that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are two individual uh, stories, two individual narratives, and some even try to argue that they're written by two different people. We, as an Adventist church, do not take a stance that there are two individual uh, messages. And here is why. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all the work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. Now, people try to say that the split between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 happens in verse 4 and into verse 5. Because now it starts to say, before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb in the field had grown, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man into the dust of the ground. Some people try to argue that this Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, does not align with Genesis chapter 1. They say that the order of the creation does not come into the correct account, and therefore they are from two different people trying to argue the same creation story. I will argue that this is not true. And the reason behind this is that at the very beginning, there is no reason for God to create sustainability for humanity through food. Okay, hear me out. If you're living in the garden, you're living in heaven, God creates plants. Have you ever noticed that when we create the creation and we have the pictures of it, have you ever noticed that on the day that we create the plants, 
that there's even on the trees and on the bushes that we, that we draw, there's never fruit. There's never fruit. There's a reason for this. Because the fruit is created as an indicator of the law that God establishes. Look at Genesis chapter 2, and it's in 15 through 17. He says, Then the Lord God took the man and put them in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man of saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, in this, the very beginning of Genesis chapter 2, you have an account where in the creation, fruit, vegetables, all this has not yet been established because God has not actually created the, man, the laws for man to follow yet. But when you hit into Genesis chapter 15, 16, and 17 is where God sets the law. And the law of it is, you shall eat of any tree except for the knowledge of good and evil, which now creates the need for plants, the needs for all of this, and man has now been created. You see, you see what's, what's happening here. Some people try to argue God created everything in the seven days, which he did, which he did, but it does not mean that it had produced yet. You see what I'm getting at? Are you with me? I see some heads nodding. Good. Okay, so plants are created to be a part of God's law. Plants and vegetables. In the law that God originally established, did he say, you can also eat the dairy of any animals of which you see? You may also eat of any of the animals. You can kill them freely. Does he say that? No, because death is not a part of the creation. Death is not part of the establishment of what God has intended for us to be. It's not there yet. The the death of an animal, the death of anything that happens, does not take place until Genesis chapter 4, which is after man has already sinned. After Adam and Eve messed up in Genesis chapter 3 and listened to the serpent, we get into Genesis chapter 4, and before we even have the murder of the first human, we have the Bible verses that talk about animal sacrifices in the story of Cain and Abel. So, death is already a factor at that point. But in the original garden, in the original intent of what God had made, there was no death. There was no need for meat. There was no need for animals. And I'm not, you know, like I said, I am not a doctor, so I'm not going to talk about like our teeth and what kind of teeth we have. I'm not going to talk about, um, about the way that our stomach digests things because that's not my field. But I can talk about what God originally did and what God put in there and the signs of what, where life and death exist. So, after God establishes this in Genesis and he puts in the original design, we know that man falls. And when man falls, man starts to uh, take the world and the creation into their own hands. Hence, the flood. It's a tragic story, but we have so many different things that happen in the book of Genesis. We have stories like the flood. We have um, Israel. We have Abraham. We have Joseph, Jacob. We have all of these individuals that come through, and the Israelites get thrown into slavery. After slavery, when we get into Exodus and Leviticus, Leviticus is where God reestablishes his law. He reestablishes his law in the book of Leviticus and in Exodus. The key note here about what happens in Leviticus. How many of you are familiar with how God established the kings for Israel? How many of you are aware of how he did it? All right, I see Levi. I see everybody else with their hands down. So nobody knows how Israel established their kings. Is that what I'm getting here of Camarillo? Nobody knows how Israel established their kings. Wow. All right. We got a lesson today. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is the story of how Saul originally becomes king. He did not become king 
purely because of birthright or anything of that nature. When Israel said that they, they said that they wanted a king, God responded to them saying, you already have one. Me. Right? That's how God established it, and they still say, no, we want a ruler. No, we want someone who's going to oversee us. And he says, wait a minute. These people, like the kings, are going to tax you. They're going to take your property. They're going to have ownership of you. There's going to be slavery. There's going to be all these things. Are you sure you want that? And Israel still answered, yes. We still want that. We want a king. So God says, fine, you want a king, I will give you a king. And that is how Saul comes in to being a king. That is very similar to what happened with our understanding of health and health principles. When you look at the book of Leviticus, and you look at Leviticus chapter 11, Humanity wanted to eat meat. Humanity wanted food of that nature because it tasted good. So in that nature, God allows it, but allows specifics. Now, just because God allows it, does that mean that it's good for you? Not necessarily. There are things that definitely happen within our Christianity, within the life that aren't always necessarily that necessarily always feel good but God allows them to take place do you see do you see where I'm going are are you with me okay so we have the situation in Leviticus where God has allowed it to take place but it is not the ideal in fact when you go to the New Testament, there is a situation where Jesus is confronted with the Pharisees and they confront him on the issue of divorce. And when they confront Jesus with the topic of divorce and they try to pin him into a situation where there is no good answer, when Jesus answers the topic of divorce, he says it was never part of the original design. That is how he answers to the Pharisees about a topic of divorce. That is very similar to what's happening here. When people said, hey, we want a king. We want things to be like the world. God says, are you sure? Like, there's a better way. This is not part of the original plan. And they say, yes, we want it. God allows humanity to do it. When it comes to the topic of meat, it is the same thing. God says, this is not part of my original plan. This is not the original way that I designed it to be. But the way that humanity begs and asks for it, God allows it. But you can see a difference between what God originally planned and what humanity decides to do with it. Turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. And Daniel is right after Ezekiel just for fun facts, in case you can't find the 12 chapters of Daniel. Old Testament, right before, or right after Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 1, this is quite possibly the most used Bible narrative story when it comes to the topic of health. So many of you are going to say, Jason, I already know this story. Good. That's good. But it never hurts to have a refresher. In Daniel chapter 1, we have the story. Uh, We're not going to read the entire thing because otherwise we'll be here way longer than you want to be. I get that. But in Daniel chapter 1, you have the story of now where Daniel and his three friends have been taken custody out of Jerusalem and are now being taken into Babylon where King Nebuchadnezzar is is, uh, ruling And Nebuchadnezzar has a chief of the kitchen whose name is Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz, he is the master of the eunuchs. And so he brings in all of these Israelites who are now prisoners of war. And as he brings them in, he tells them, you are going to be servants of the king 
here is what you are going to do. And in order to serve the king, you have to eat what the king requires. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whose names are changed, from Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, these four individuals tell the chief priests, they say it in verse 8, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But Daniel proposed in his heart, hey look, heart, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Ashpenaz is under the impression that if Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to eat this food that the king has made, that they will look scrawny and weak. We know today, you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a nutritionist to necessarily know that when you switch to a plant-based diet, you actually get stronger. In this story, they were under the impression that as long as, you know, if you apply it to today, as long as you have your calories, as long as you have a certain amount of protein, as long as you, you know, do what you need to do, you will look great. But Daniel challenges it. And he, sa- and he offers to Aspenaz, let us do this where we're only able to eat, he has vegetables to eat, and he has waters to drink. That's all he asked for. And at the end of just 10 days, in verse 15, it says, at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portions of the king's delicacies. Thus, the stewards took away their portions of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, Daniel is blessed by God to be able to understand visions and dreams, to be given literature and wisdom. This is something that is given to us as a gift of God. I want you to understand that because the message of health in itself is a gift from God. If that counts as a gift from God, then the gift that you receive of wisdom through the way of which you eat in your diet is also a gift of God. Now, some of you may be saying, why are you talking about gifts of God? That's because I've been reading a lot of Ezekiel. I'm not Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes. A lot of Ecclesiastes recently, and when you read Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that everything, everything is a gift from God. And the man who had the most wisdom in the world, I think he's on to something. So, the things that Daniel is referring to not eat, which I was mentioning in Leviticus chapter 11, he's talking about bovines, he's talking about sheep, goats, deer, antelope, technically giraffes. He's talking about uh, mammals and different things in the sea, sea, such as whales, dolphins, dugongs, uh, also referring to sharks. Sharks don't have scales. Uh, We're referring to any flying animals such as eagles, ravens, owls, hawks, vultures, and it says non, like the, it says insects that don't fly. So he's talking about basically locusts, but let's be real. In America, we don't eat insects. We're we're good on those. (laughs) We're we're good. But one of the one of the interesting things I, I just wanted to mention as a disclaimer is that in the Hebrew Bible, they don't actually know how to translate the names of the insects. I, I just want, 
if you think about it, because the original Hebrew texts were brought as the Torah, and during the Babylonian exile, a lot of the, the temple itself was destroyed. And so when it came back during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, in order to translate the Greek and Hebrew, they had to get people for over 70, 80 years that hadn't read a Hebrew text and to try to get them to rewrite it as a lost language. So in Hebrew, originally it was so well known, so well memorized as the Bible that they didn't even have to put in vowels. Can you imagine trying to read the Bible, trying to read any literature today without vowels? We as an English language could not do it. We, we would have to sit there for a while to puzzle how to do it. In Hebrew, they understood it so well, they didn't have to have the vowels. They only needed consonants to be able to translate it. But as the language got lost, they had to add them in because they couldn't keep up with it. But in doing so, they lost the translation of the names of the insects in Leviticus chapter 11. For us today, as a, as a more modern society in the United States, it's kind of, it's like it's relevant, but it's, we also don't eat insects. So, like, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, well, we know that there's insects you can't eat, and we know what some of them are. We know the descriptions of them, but they, we don't know the actual names of the insects that they were specifically calling out from the original language. Maybe, just maybe someday, we will figure it out. But so far, I haven't found a source that actually says the exact ones um, from a literal translation. Now, we've talked about Daniel chapter 1. And the way that it is actually established that there is a good practice and principle of health. We have the original diet that is established in Genesis chapter 1. And we also have uh, the, the law that was established in Leviticus as a temporary understanding. But I also want to draw your attention to one other thing in Leviticus. Because this is something that I had to ask myself. If we are really talking about a plant-based diet and we are talking about the original intent in the, in the garden, why is it that in the burnt off, not the burnt offering, in the five different offerings that are mentioned at the beginning of Leviticus, why are the priests and the offerers allowed to eat the meat of the different sacrifices? In Leviticus chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, and 7, 11 through 16, it talks about the peace offering. And in it, the blood, of the, uh, the blood of the lamb that is sacrificed is put on the sides of the altar, and the meat is given to the priest and to the offerer. In Leviticus chapter 4, verses 1 through 35, it is the sin offering in which the blood is poured on the horns of the altar, and the meat is given to the priest. Leviticus chapter 5, verses 1 through 19, is the offering of trespass. The blood is put on the sides, and the priests are to eat the meat. Again. The way that I understand this, the way that it was also mentioned to me during my time at Andrews, which totally makes sense to me, is we first have to ask ourselves, what was the point of the animal sacrifices? What's the point behind animal sacrifices? Each one of the five different sacrifices that are mentioned in Leviticus chapter 1 to Leviticus chapter 5 are giving examples about the true sacrifice of Christ. You hear me? All Five sacrifices of Leviticus are pointing to the one sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. With the burnt offering, Christ's life was consumed and brought to the Lord. The grain offering is a supplying of food in which Christ provides internal life. The peace offering is an establishment of well-being between our neighbors, which is why it is offered between the priest and the offerer. You have the sin offering, 
which is, um, in many ways, think of it similarly to how we do communion. We all partake of the bread. We are consuming of it. That is similar to what the lamb was meant to be as a sacrifice in the sin offering. It's an understanding of our sins and partaking of it. And then you have trespass, which is also Christ pays the debt of sin. Christ paying for us. So, what's happening here as a symbol or as an example is that God is showing a way in which, God, in, in which Jesus provides for us. God is showing a way in which Jesus provides for us and how he does it. It in itself is not meant as an example of how to live a healthy life, but it is, ex- it is an example of what happens in sin. The natural response to what happens to our sins is death. That is the qualification of what it is. For us, our qualification was given by the death of Jesus. He covers for our blood. He covers for our sins. In this way, when we look at the animal sacrifices, even though they were offered to the priest to consume, it is meant as a symbol or as a metaphor more so than it is as a measurement of healthiness. It is not meant to measure the healthiness of them. It is not meant to even describe them as being unclean or clean. God determined these meats clean for the moment. Now, since I'm talking about clean, before I completely lose you and sidetrack you guys, please turn to Mark. Mark chapter 7. This is one of the verses that is taken out of context constantly. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. This is where everything starts to align. Of what I've mentioned in Leviticus, of what I've mentioned in Daniel, what I've mentioned in Genesis, this is where everything starts to come together. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace... They do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribe asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered them and said, Jesus said, Well, Did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you holding the traditions of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, may, may other such things you do. He said to them, All too well, you reject the commandment of God, you may keep your tradition. And as he says this, uh, let me check one more thing with the notes. In the way that he does it, when he says of teaching the doctrines of men, depending on the different translations of what you have, I want you to understand this, that there is a, a section here that is saying that Jesus makes meat clean. It's saying that he makes meat clean. If you look at it in your RSV, NRSV, or NAB, when it talks about them washing their hands, in these different ways it says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. In the NIV, it says, by saying this, he showed that every kind of food is acceptable. 
In the NLT, he says, thus he pronounced all food clean. In the NJB, he says, thus he was making and declaring all food ceremonially clean, that is, abolishing the ceremonial distinctions of the ceremonial law. In Mark chapter 7, you have a, a situation in which they're trying to call out Jesus for eating with unwashed hands, for eating in a way that has defiled food. And in the way that he answers it, he is, some people take this translation to say that Jesus made all meats clean, therefore I can eat whatever I want. I can eat whatever I need, whatever applies to me. And they, and they say, besides, anyways, today we have a, so much of a better understanding of food and how to cook it, it's fine. But I want to show you the context of what Jesus is doing. First off, what Jesus is arguing about when it comes to defilement, he mentions that, he says, Their people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He is talking about a way in which people defile themselves for what comes, not from what comes in, but for what goes out. What comes out of their mouths, what comes out of them is more of an issue than what's going in. So, Jesus, when he says that he makes all things clean, in Mark chapter 7, I want, to, I want you to understand something critical about Mark chapter 7. And that that is that Jesus is setting the way for, example, for salvation to exist for everyone. Jesus is setting a way in which salvation can exist for everyone. When you look at the law, the law that was established in the Old Testament. This law was created in a way for man to be able to remain ceremonially clean temporarily. Right? So no usage of meat, no, no use, and if you did, of specific kinds. He has very specific rules that had come up due to the Jews. We have a phrase for this, and it is called legalism. Legalism, which is where the law in itself becomes your salvation. When you think about the Jews and the Pharisees and what they were doing during Jesus' time, it was all about, I can't go this far or else I'm unclean. I can't do this or I'm unclean. I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Jesus had to break that. Jesus had to break the law. He had to, he had to break this understanding of what the law represented and reestablish what it was originally designed to be. What it was originally intended to be. So when we look here of when he says he makes things clean, he is preparing the way for salvation to exist for the Gentiles. The Gentiles are not held by the same law, the same structure as the Jews. Neither are we. If we were still held by the principles of the Jews, we would still be doing the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We would still be doing animal sacrifices. We would still be doing all these things, but we don't need to because Jesus, because of Jesus, we don't need to do that anymore. This has in itself been ratified, been dealt with. So when Jesus is saying he is making all meats clean, he is not saying I am doing away with the law, but he is changing the way that we understand the law and what it represents. Now, since I'm saying, talking about things that are taken out of context, let's also not forget in Acts. In Acts, Peter is given a vision. He's given a vision of this table, and the table is covered with unclean animals, unclean meats. And when it's brought to him, like God says, partake of it. Eat the unclean meats. And Peter says, no, never. I would never do this. I would never defile myself. And God says, this is true. You haven't. But he's not talking about animals. He's talking about people. In Acts, the vision that he gives of the meats of unclean animals, he is talking about people. He is talking about the Gentiles. 
When he's talking about the Gentiles, the next day Peter goes to meet somebody who is a Gentile and he immediately recognizes what Jesus is talking about, or what God was telling him in his vision about meeting people. So, what we get from the message of Genesis to Daniel to Mark to Acts and what we're going to see here soon with Paul Health is something that is a part of God's original intent. It is not a measurement of salvation. Health is not a measurement of salvation. If it was, this would not have changed. Did, has Sabbath ever changed by God's standing? No. No. Man has tried to change Sabbath. God has not changed the Sabbath. Has God changed the Ten Commandments? No. God has not changed the Ten Commandments. God did change the rules of health. He did. Health is not a measurement of our salvation. It is an expression of our understanding of who God is and our love with Him. There is one last text that I want that will combine this all together, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For if we say that health is not salvation, what is the point of learning it? What is the point of utilizing it? Paul has the answer for why health is important. Why healthy living habits are important. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is on a mission to convince the Corinthians about living in a way that is constantly promoting Christ. In everything that you do, it is for the glory and the honor of God. So, somebody sent a message to Paul asking a question about eating meats that are sold in a marketplace or also eating of meats that are used in the, as a, a sacrifice and whether or not a person should use them if they were used in a pagan ritual. Paul answers. He starts in verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. He says, For all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are are lawful for me, but not, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, Eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience' sake. But if one says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who told you, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks... Why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I gave thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved." I want to point out a critical piece of this. The critical piece of this is verse 33. Jesus does not just say, okay, we'll eat whatever you want. Do whatever you want. It's okay. What Jesus is, what what Paul is saying through this insight that he has been given is that in everything you do, when you encounter another person, do it to bring them closer to Christ. 
Do it to bring them closer to Christ. If that means saying thank you depending on their culture, then do so. If that means that you may actually have to say, no, I'm not going to touch it because that's against my religion, that's against what I believe, then do so. But it is for the purpose to bring people to Christ, not to push them away from Christ. So, what do we do with this? The original intent of the health message that God left from us is a plant-based diet. That is the original plan that God had for us. As we fell into sin and as we fell into our own temptations, we asked for meat and God allowed it to be so. And, they, and God created a way within the laws to offer salvation to everybody, and it is not salvation through food or through the actions or works of what we do. That is not what gets us into heaven and to be with God. But health plays a role in how we share God's message to others. Health is a vital role in helping people understand the character of God and the way in which God created us to be and how for us to thrive. This weekend we have the, health, the whole conference. As Eduardo mentioned earlier, we have over 600 people that have signed up to be a part of this, and most of them are not Adventist. This is a double whammy. This is something that benefits for us on both sides because it allows us not only, like we already have a, so to speak, we already have a hook in there for them because they believe in health. We believe in health. They may not know Jesus yet, we do. We have an opportunity here to share Jesus with people that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ before. Or if they have, they have heard a character and a portrayal of Jesus which is not the Jesus that we know. We have an opportunity this weekend to share Jesus with people, to share health, to share understanding, to share biblical principles with people. They will physically be walking into this sanctuary, into these halls tomorrow, and we have an opportunity to reach them. So, my question for you, now that we've talked about the original diet, we've talked about man and their cravings, we've talked about how Jesus made salvation avail available to all, and to use health for the purpose of bringing people to Christ. How are we going to plant the seed? How are we going to plant the seed of Christ into people? Into their hearts, into their lives, so that Christ can blossom into their lives. We have an opportunity. We have a profound message, not just of, our, of the gospel, but of health. And health is in sync with the gospel. So, what will you do with this seed? What will you do with the health principle that God established? And how will you share it with the world today? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the Sabbath. I thank you for this day that we could come together and talk about this message. To some, it's a struggle. For some, they may already be turning away saying, no, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want to change my diet. I don't want to change my lifestyle. And maybe it's not even a principle of health in the concept of what we eat. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe it's sleep. Maybe it's the time in which we eat. All of these different things are me preaching to myself. But Lord, I hope that in some ways this applies to all of us that it may impact us to seriously consider the way in which you wanted us to live, the way that you designed us to be. And may this be our prayer, Lord, to try to be closer in sync with you. 
to be closer to the way that you designed us to be, and to be ever closer to you. May this message of health, may the lessons that we've learned about diet and exercise and sleep, anxiety, stress, all of these different things, Lord, may they all be used for your glory. May they be used to teach people about you and not of ourselves. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you too.